Now, we're going to talk about, a little bit about translation, and that involves languages. How many of you are fluent in more than one language? Anybody? <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, uh, so, coming to the Bible itself, uh, as you've as we've dis uh, you've discussed before, I'm sure you know, we know that it's the very Word of God. The original manuscripts were inspired by God, and the uh, Bible is our. Uh, authority for our faith and practice, for what we believe and how we live it is really based on what, what the Bible says. Now, said so the or original manuscripts were inspired by God, which presents us with a problem. Uh, next slide. Got to make this work too. Okay, the problem being that the Bible was written mainly in Hebrew and Greek, and we can't understand Hebrew and Greek. And that, in fact, was a problem even before the time of Christ. That uh, in Ale uh, Alexandria in Egypt, about 200 years before Christ, there was a Jewish colony there where the Jews uh, no longer knew Hebrew or knew very little Hebrew. Common language, language was Greek because it had been settled by the uh, followers of Alexander the Great, who was a Greek. And uh, then what the uh, Jews did was, because people knew Greek, their people, the Jews, knew more Greek than they knew Hebrew. They translated the Bible into Greek, and that was one of the, probably the first translation from one language to another. And it was done by, uh, uh, supposedly by 70 scholars. That's why it's called the Septuagint, or the, which means 70, and it's abbreviated usually as LXX the Latin number for 70. Now this was the by, uh, yeah. Just a quick question, you said it's like Greek. Could that be because of Alexander the Great? Yes, yeah. yeah. Okay. And his, his followers, uh, really four of them, split up his empire. And uh, uh, so the Greek uh, became the, the uh, common language of the Mediterranean area. Uh, English is becoming the world's common language nowadays, which really is fortunate for us, but then in other ways unfortunate because we don't have to learn any other language, and we can get by almost anywhere with just English. But anyway, so this was the, also the Bible that uh, the, uh, the early Christians used. Uh, most of Paul's quotations in the New Testament, in his epistles, uh, are taken from the uh, Septuagint. Uh, uh, some of them are his own translations from the Hebrew, but most of them are straight from the, uh, from the Septuagint. Now then what happened after that time uh, was that the western part of the empire uh, was uh, the people there spoke more Latin than Greek, which made it difficult for uh, those people to understand Greek. Same problem the Jews had with uh, Hebrew in Alexandria. People in the western part of the Roman Empire had trouble with Greek. So around 400 AD, uh, Jerome made a Latin translation and he translated it from the Hebrew and the, uh, the Greek, and that was known as the Vulgate, which came from the word vulgar, which meant the common people. So the idea then was that rather than have a, a Bible in a couple of holy languages, Greek and Hebrew, they had 
uh, could have the uh, Bible in their own language, which has been a problem down through the ages since then, as we'll see. And uh, east, of the, east of Palestine, uh, the people didn't speak Greek either, but neither did they speak Latin. They spoke Aramaic, and so they had their own translation in Aramaic. Now, when it comes to a language, the things you have to consider in the language are, uh, first of all, the meaning of the word, the dictionary definition. Now, a dictionary definition will give you some idea of a word, but it's not... Uh, doesn't really tell you exactly uh, what, uh, what you mean. Then we have to consider the grammar. Uh, language grammar can be very different from one language to another, and we'll look at a couple of things that we may, uh, that are quite stra straightforward, that'll show us how the language can, uh, the grammar can affect the language. Then there's the sentence structure, the syntax, the idiom, and the context makes a lot of difference. Depending on what you're talking about, uh, it tells you what's, what sort of words that you should use. Uh, and the genre is the style, and we'll look at that in a moment. Then there's the, uh, there are a couple of terms that are used commonly. One is transliteration versus translation. Transliteration is just putting a word, uh, uh, the, using the, changing the letters from one alphabet to another. And the Greek alphabet and the Hebrew alphabets are very different from the ones we use, when we use. And I've taken the couple of words that I came across in, in Russian, and you can see that the, the Russian alphabet there is somewhat different. You probably noticed, uh, if you watched any hockey games back in the old days, the uh, Russians all wore uh, uniforms that had what we would consider as CCCP on them. That is actually the Russian for SSSR. So the, if we transliterate the, that, it's SSSR. If we translate it, it, in English, it becomes USSR, the Union of Soviet Social Republics. So there's the difference. And names usually are transliterated, they're not translated. So that uh, Abraham, uh, yes, means the father of many nations. So we don't call him in the Bible, we don't read the, whenever we come across Abraham, it's not uh, father of the nations, it's Abraham and so on. Uh, Abraham, Abraham means father of many nations. Okay, so we don't, we don't, uh, in our Bible, when we read Genesis, it's all, well, we always see the word Abraham. We don't see uh, that, uh, the, that the father of uh, Isaac was the father of the nations. Okay, does that make a little sense? Yeah, yeah. okay. And uh, let's see, that's that one. And when it comes to word meanings, uh, words have a, every word has a range of meaning. Uh, no word is a, it's not like a pinpoint where it means exactly this, but not anything else. And there's a, uh, often there's an, uh, an overlap between meanings of words. Like if we take the word hard, uh, you can see that it can mean something that is hard, like a rock, rock-like, is one meaning of hard. Another meaning of hard is difficult. Learning another language is difficult. But it is nothing like a rock. It's not a solid chunk of material. 
But then when you come to a strenuous and difficult, there's some overlap there as well. So that there's always some overlap. And the same thing happens with, uh, with translating words. Uh, there's a funny story about a, an Estonian man who came to uh, Canada and he really didn't know any English, but he had a dictionary and he got a sore throat and uh, so he looked up in the dictionary and saw what the uh, words for in Estonian, it's mullan valus kurk. So he looked up those words in the dictionary and he came up with, I have sore cucumber. And the reason for that is because in Estonian, the word kurk means both throat and cucumber. So when he had the choice of picking up a strange word in the dictionary, one he, in a language he didn't know, he picked the wrong word. So, so that's a, a possibility that happens if you try to use just the going word by word. Rather than a concept. Rather than a concept, yeah. And then uh, when it comes to some of the grammatic, idiomatic ex expressions, like in English, we would say, I am cold. A Frenchman would say, j'ai froid, which means I have cold. Not I am, but I have cold. In Estonian, the construction's even more odd. Uh, mul on uh, means on me is. On me is cold which really doesn't make any sense at all in English. Would you say that in Estonian? Would you say that? Mul on külm is the way you would say it. Okay. And literally translating it word by word, it comes out, on me is cold. Uh, and then uh, uh, in uh, English, we usually put the adjective before a noun. In French, it's the other way around. And that can mess up a meaning if you're trying to translate word by word, the way some people suggest that translation should go. Red blood in English means blood that is red in color, right? And in French, they switch it around and they say song rouge, blood red, literally. Now, if you take the words blood, song rouge and translate them one by one into English, what you get is blood red. And the phrase blood red really means in English, uh, the color of uh, red, the color of blood. Totally different thing from red blood. And then there's sentence structure. Uh, generally in German, the verb at the end of a sentence is put. If, if any of you have encountered German, that's the way they, they speak. Uh, and uh, then in English, word order actually is critical. The boy bit the dog is very different from the dog bit the boy. Now, if you take Estonian, because the word endings are different, you can put the words in the order of the boy, uh, and the boy, and then the word for bit, and then dog. But the boy is in the form of the object, and the dog is in the form of the subject, so that we can turn that around and yet have the same meaning. So there again, you can't just translate word by word, literally. Then we mentioned context. It's the, the sentence around the word determines its meaning. And then the genre is the type of literature. And that makes a difference too, that if uh, uh, fiction is quite different from history and, and different from poetry, and now, if we had a story that starts once upon a time, what do you think that is? 
Is that history? What, what stories start in English with once upon a time? Fairy tales. So you know it's a fairy tale right from the start. So that's part of the genre. And you know that you, no one expects you to fully believe all the details of the fairy tale because it's, a lot of it is magic. Then the requirements of a translator. A translator has to have some, some special abilities. Uh, for one thing, he must have a thorough knowledge of the original or donor language. If you have a sort of a sketchy knowledge, you don't really know what the uh, word means because words have an, they, they don't have a specific, uh, they don't have a sort of general meaning. Like there's a difference between, even with when we said hard, between strenuous and difficult. Strenuous means more along the line of, uh, to me anyway, means more along the line of physically difficult that needs a lot of e energy. Uh, difficult uh, can mean uh, mentally difficult, like an arithmetic problem, but it's not necessarily strenuous in that uh, I'd sweat, I'd literally sweat over it. Um, <clears throat> and then he has to, the person has to know the recipient language as well that you have to know the language you're translating into. Uh, again, you can, it's like that Estonian we mentioned that he didn't know the recipient language well, so he came up with something totally ridiculous. And then you have to know the subject translated. Uh, Paul, you were a mechanic, so you, you know about things that do with cars, and you have a special vocabulary uh, in, in your work. And some of those words are words that may be common in other, other areas. For example, if, uh, if you're ask, ask, to ask me while you're fixing your car, hand me the nut. And then, uh, what do I, and then if I don't really know what you mean, I could hand you a peanut. <laughs> Which is a nut. You ask for a nut, I give you a nut. Sorry? Who was that? The apostles? They, the New Testament was written in Greek. They, they spoke, ordinarily spoke Greek. Yeah. That was a common language, the same as English is for us here. Uh, now, uh, the... The Jewish people? Well, they, uh, what happens with a small country like Israel in, in those days, is that people tend to, uh, the, their own language was Hebrew. Uh, but nobody but a, a Jew would learn Hebrew. So if you want to communicate with anyone else coming in, you'd have to learn some other language. And, uh, uh, and that, uh, th that language then became Greek. Uh, and as there was more travel around the Mediterranean, you have to have more and more have to have one common language. Sort of like, uh, like us. You know, uh, we flew a, a couple of years ago on Iceland Air. And uh, the announcements were made first in, in Icelandic. And I listened very closely to it. And I finally picked out one word. That, that I could figure out what it meant, partly from the context and partly from knowing sort of what the announcement was about. Uh, uh, now, the Icelanders have to learn some other language when they go anywhere else because who's going to learn Icelandic if you're not in Iceland? 
In fact, as an Estonian, we have the same problem. It's a small country with a million people, just a million people, about the, 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 about the population of Edmonton that speak that language. And it's a very different language, as you may have noticed. So we have to learn some other language as well. And uh, in the schools in Estonia, they teach uh, several, every kid learns two or three foreign languages. Uh, so that's what happened there. But the, uh, because, now Paul, for example, was a Jew. So, and he had studied, uh, their, his scriptures were all in, uh, originally were in Hebrew. Uh, but of course, he read Greek as well. He lived in a uh, in uh, Asia Minor, uh, where there was not where there's a small Jewish community, but the general community around him, they all spoke Greek. So he had to learn Greek as well. So Greek was the common language. So if he was going to communicate with his neighbors, other than other Jews, he'd have to learn Greek. And that happened in Palestine as well. There were, uh, uh, I think, uh, I think the uh, apostles pretty well spoke. Everybody spoke some Greek as well as uh, as Hebrew, or well, there's Aramaic, which is a form of Hebrew in those days. Does that help? Okay. <laughs> Yeah, that's like a, a friend of mine said, uh, you know, uh, I can speak any language but Greek. So you try him with another language and he said, oh, well, that's Greek to me. <laughs> okay, so then we have to know also the term, he has to know the terminology of the subject, the culture of the original writers, especially if there's anything more than just the simplest stuff. Uh, he has to have intellectual integrity, which means that he has to be honest in what he's translating. Uh, he can't just decide, well, I'm going to, I, I don't like the, the way this is worded or this is said. Uh, I'm going to put it in my, my own way and twist it around. Um, and he has to have a philosophy of translation, which we'll look at in a moment. And for a biblical Translator, he had to have a proper theology. Uh, there is a, uh, a a New World translation of the Bible. Has anyone heard of the New World translation? Well, no, this is a New World translation. It was made by the Jehovah's Witnesses, and they don't believe in the Trinity. Now, they believe in one God, Jehovah. They don't believe that Jesus is divine, that he is the Son of God. They, they, so what they did was, when they translated the New Testament, whenever it said Jesus is the Son of God, uh, they translated it as Jesus is a Son of God, which means something totally different from Jesus is the Son of God. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, they uh, see they, and then they use their Bible, which they translated on the basis of the, their theology to prove their theology. See the circular argument. So okay. So as we go on. So the philosophy of translation, uh, some people try for word for word, which really we saw was really impossible except for uh, sim uh, single words. There's a literal translation, which is as close to word for word as possible. And sometimes it sounds awkward in the recipient language, uh, even if you correct for the idiom, uh, it doesn't come, come across very well. 
Then there's what's known as what they, is called the dynamic equivalent, trying to get as close as possible to the intent and mood of the donor language, the, the original language. And then there's a paraphrase where a translator uses more of his own words, tries to get the best modern meaning. And a uh, paraphrase is putting something into your own words. You know, when I was in high school, we were told to read a story and then paraphrase it, write the story in your own words. Uh, we couldn't copy what uh, was written. You had to change it into our own words, but not change the meaning. Then the translation can be made from an original language or a translation can also be made from a, another translation, uh, either the recipient or a, other language. So that uh, what was done in the late Middle Ages or early modern era, the uh, people took Jer uh, Jerome's Vulgate, which was a Latin translation, and they translated it into their own language. I think that's what uh, Wycliffe did initially. Uh, he didn't go back to the original uh, Greek and Hebrew. He took the Vulgate and translated that. And actually the Roman Catholic Church has done the same thing because the Vulgate is the, the only true word of God, according to them. Problems of a translator? Well, the first problem is getting a complete, reliable, accurate donor language text. And this has been one of the, one of the things that Bible scholars have struggled with over the, over the centuries. Uh, and this is where I think we had a lot of uh, sessions, we had a session or two about the transmission of, uh, of the, uh, the Bible through the ages and you try to get the best uh, document you can there. Sometimes the syntax can, can be ambiguous. And one of the problems was that the Bible manuscripts had no punctuation in there. Now, if you look at that bottom bit on the, uh, we are following, yeah. Well, good for you, you're doing better than I, I am. Uh, the, um, there's that modern chorus, here I am, Lord. And that really, uh, what does that mean to you? Here I am, Lord. I'm available, Lord. Now if we leave the comma out, what does it mean? In this area, I'm the Lord. Yeah, it's blasphemy, to put it bluntly. Here, I am Lord, here, I am Lord, is, is the way it's, it, yeah, that's with the comma. Without the comma, it's here, I am Lord. You see the difference? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, that was a, yeah, that was a special way that he said it for special reasons. Yeah, yeah. But I, I'm just saying that just simple English, uh, the way that the English reads. Okay, let's go on to the next one. Uh, we can look at some of the English translations, the early history, the 1500s was sort of a time of sort of a golden age of, translation into English. Then we'll look at the King James Version, revisions of it and modern translations in the last couple of centuries. And then we'll look at choosing a translation. Then the next slide, uh, looking at development of languages. Languages change. Uh, an oral language cha uh, changes quickly, a written language takes longer. So I'm going to look at, we'll look here at something that was in what was known as Old English. Uh, England had been a Roman colony, so Latin was uh, a, a prominent language until about 500 uh, when the Roman Empire in the West collapsed and then the Saxons from, and Angles from uh, 
Germany and uh, uh, Denmark invaded and Scandinavians, the Vikings. Uh, so they added their languages to the British Latin and they came up with what is known as Old English. Now if you look at that left-hand column, uh, there's probably nothing you can read and understand in that. And that's Old English. There's some little similarities there that we might think of as uh, to English. If you look at the third line uh, where it says work, and then you look at the, uh, on the right hand side, work, so that might be the same word that became work. It sounds very similar. Then there's fodder, which is probably father. And then the bottom line, uh, heaven till roofa, uh, heaven, heaven as a roof. So you can see the heaven, and V and, v and B are often interchangeable. Like uh, the Spanish, the Spaniards switch them around all the time. It, it, yeah, it is. Yeah, it was uh, the, uh, the uh, Saxon Angle, Ang Angles and Saxons, they spoke of an ancient form of German. So that really English is what's called a Germanic language. Now that's the old English, which is, you know, there's no way that we could really understand that. Then uh, uh, we came to Middle English uh, later on in the, in the Middle Ages. After 1066, you know, the Norman French came. So Norman French was the language of the aristocracy, the conquerors. Latin was the language of the, of the educated people still, particularly church people, church uh, officials. And Old English was the language of the common people. And then gradually these languages sort of merged and became Middle English. And this is more like our modern English. So by, the, uh, by around 1400, a little before 1400, uh, we have this sort of a thing uh, that we can sort of make out what he's talking about. No. Welsh is a totally different language, totally different language group altogether. And it's a Celtic language. It's similar to uh, uh, the old, old uh, Scottish Celtic and Irish and, uh, and actually the language that was spoken in Brittany and in Cornwall. You had a question? Yeah, 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 okay. Yeah, so those are totally different groups of, of languages. Uh, you've, you've got that in your handout too, you can look at it a little, a little more closely later. Then modern English started about 1500 when printing was invented and from that time on, the English language more or less stabilized. And the changes since then have been relatively minor and few. Uh, Tyndale's and Coverdale's English Bible is quite easy for us to understand now. And at the very back of your handout, uh, the final page there is King James Version. And uh, on the other side are a couple of uh, excerpts from Tyndale's English. And you'll notice that you, you can make out that pretty well, but uh, uh, they, had, they didn't care about their spelling. The spelling tended to be very uh, sketchy. Uh, and that was even true at the time of the King James Version. But if you try to read it, you can sort of follow it. And over the years, uh, grammar has become simplified. For example, the, uh, at the time of the King James, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the subjective you was ye, 
and the object was you. So we'd say, uh, uh, how would I put it now? Uh, ye are so and so, or come to uh, go to you. Uh, and of course, they also use thou, thee, and thy for the singular, and you was always plural. Uh, now, this makes uh, a, a little bit of difficulty for us in our modern English translations because. In, certainly in Greek, they differentiate between the singular you and the plural you, but in the modern translations, of course, they're both you. So we don't know whether Paul is addressing one person or whether he's addressing a large group of people. Now you can sometimes sort that out from context, but sometimes it can be difficult. Okay, so examples. Well, there I've given the thou and, uh, and other words that have disappeared recently, for example. Whom has gone in the last 20 years or so? It's been replaced by who? Even in some of the, the better uh, written books, uh, they write who instead of whom now. And, uh, and of course, uh, with the inclusive language, they, people want to do away with, some people want to do away with he, she, him, her, and so on, and replace it with the plural they, which is sort of analogous to getting rid of the, thou, and replacing it with you. And then, uh, of course, the word like gay used to mean happy. You read something written a uh, hundred years ago, and it's got nothing to do with homosexuality. And then you've got things like the word prevent in 1 Thessalonians 4, which there means go before, when he talks about the uh, this Jesus' second coming. Uh, okay, er, the early English word, now we'll come to the translations themselves that have been made. And there have been, it's a long, long, complicated history, really. Uh, where were we? Uh, I'm getting way ahead in my thing, anyway. How did I get there? Okay, the early English versions, have you got that up there? Yeah, good. Around 700, they're starting to make some translations into the early English. Uh, you got a list of them there. Uh, we can, uh, you can look at that more closely in your, uh, your handout. And then the, uh, the church insisted that the Vulgate is the true word of God not to, uh, not to be used by uneducated people. Uneducated people couldn't understand the word of God, therefore they were forbidden to read it and they were especially forbidden to read it in their own languages. And then John Wycliffe came along at about uh, the late 1300s and translated from the Vulgate into English. And at the same time, there's a man named John Huss in Bohemia who did the same sort of thing from the Vulgate into Czech, and both of them were burned at the stake for their efforts of, tr of trying to bring the Word of God to the ordinary people. And then there's a golden age of Bible translation, William Tyndale. His goal was that every plowboy in England could read the Word of God for himself, which was absolute heresy as far as the Roman Catholic Church was concerned. So they burned him. Uh, his contemporary was Coverdale. And then about the same time, there were a whole bunch of other English translations made. And uh, I just listed a couple of them there. Um, uh, 
before the King James Version came in. And one of the reasons for the King James Version was that there were so many Bibles around at the time. And King James decided that uh, in the churches they should have just one version, one common version, which he himself would authorize to be read in the churches. So the authorized version, uh, authorized simply means that it was King James who said, These are the, this is the version that will be read in the churches. About the same time, the Catholics decided to make their own uh, um, English version. And uh, they, uh, the Catholics were thrown out of England at the time of Queen Elizabeth, so they uh, had to be in Reims and Douai or in France. So they were doing their translation in France and smuggling their version of the scriptures into, into England. And they translated just the Vul straight from the Vulgate. They refused to go back to the old Hebrew and Greek, which is what Tyndale did. Um, <clears throat> okay, so that's... Uh, and then uh, after the uh, King James Version, uh, there are multiple version, revisions of the King James over the next couple of centuries, and John Wesley himself is reported to have made as many as 20,000 changes in the King James Version, which he said were corrections. Uh, most of them were very minor, probably spelling things. And then in uh, 1870, the uh, Britain uh, English said, uh, that uh, the King James Version is uh, 250 years old now and people are having trouble understanding it, so let's revise it. So they revised, it, they revised the King James Version. They did not write a, a translate it uh, from scratch, they just revised the King James. Then the Americans did the same with the American Standard Version and, and 1901, and then in about 19, uh, late 1940s, the Americans came out with their revised standard version, which was a revision of the American standard version. Uh, and uh, some of those, uh, uh, we're going to look at those in a, more in detail in a moment when we try to assess these. Okay, and then there was then there's been a sort of a a second era of sort of a golden age of translation of the Bible into English. A man named J. B. Phillips started in England about 1940-41 when his youth group couldn't understand the King James version, so he made his own translation. Uh, then the Americans came out with the New American Standard Version. Uh, William Barclay, uh, the man who wrote the Daily Bible Study Notes, made his own. Then uh, the uh, Church of England uh, decided that they really needed to make a brand new translation in modern English. So they came out with a new English Bible, which really didn't catch on at all. The Roman Catholics at the same time came up with a, uh, the New American Bible. And at the same time, there's a man named uh, Taylor who uh, used the King James Version and his uh, family devotions. And when he asked his que uh, kids questions about what they'd read or what they'd heard read, they had no idea what they had heard. And so he paraphrased it. Uh, the new uh, the living bible was a paraphrase from english to english so he took the uh, um, previous english translation and paraphrased it into his own way and then the good news bible was produced by well by the uh, uh, these are all in in uh, detailed notes there uh, and uh, under the section 20th century. I 
see we're running a little late. Sure, is that right? Quarter after seven, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 That's interesting how that's reversed. Yeah. So that even in the King James, there was some a time there was some sense of using what we nowadays call inclusive language. Like the the new uh, New King James has sons of God. The NIV has sons of God. The original King James has children of God. And this is Matthew 5, 9, uh, that blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Yeah, they have, they have come up with a, uh, you can see there under the list that I made of the uh, NIV. Uh, that they've uh, there have been several revisions of that and some controversy over that as well and uh, a fellow I used to know when he was just a kid uh, who's now a, a retiring uh, Bible well-known Bible scholar in the States uh, Donald Carson uh, he wrote a book about this uh, inclusive uh, uh, language debate that when this uh, NIVI came out. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that. <clears throat> it's, uh, it's a complicated story about uh, all of these. Uh... But anyway, there have been, and there have been actually been some 500 different translations into English. So there's no way we can cover those in an evening. And as I put somewhere in the notes, there, uh, that the the way the NIV worked was that the one uh, one person made a translation. Then it was reviewed by several other people, uh, and then more people reviewed again and again and again, and and improved. And. Uh, uh, that's where the single person translations, and there's some of them around. There's a guy named Williams made one, a man named Moffat made one in the 100 years ago. Uh, Barclay, you said, made one. Phillips did one. Uh, now, they were all single author uh, translations, which has some, uh, some merit in that they, it tends the style tends to be the same throughout, but it has the disadvantage that some of the meaning may not be as good. And uh, I know what Phillips did was he used some scholars that he knew to review his, uh, his translation and to revise it and make it more accurate. Yeah, that makes a difference too, yeah. Like uh, Taylor, uh, 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 Taylor's theology was uh, what's called Arminian. He tended to believe that people could be saved and lost. Whereas the standard, usual Baptist uh, belief is once saved, you're always saved. You don't lose your salvation. <laughs> So that uh, the living, the original living Bible had some of the uh, Arminian theology in it, which was one of the criticisms of it. The new living translation 
See, the first one was, the title of it, the first one, Taylor's, was Living Bible Paraphrased. So it was a paraphrase. He had said right off the bat, it's a paraphrase. And then when they tried to come up with a new Living Bible, the, there were a quite a large number of um, scholars who did the translation, different parts, uh, and it's an actual translation, so it really has no relationship to the old Living Bible. Interestingly, when I looked through that list of names, there were, uh, they're all uh, in, uh, uh, all these scholars are working in the States now, but two of them were Canadians. One was Donald Carson, who grew up in Drummondville, a few miles from where Josh grew up. The other, another one was uh, Jerry Borchert, who grew up in Calgary. So we have a Canadian connection to the New Living Translation. Well, most of, most of the translations, the common ones, the ones that are used mostly, are uh, the effort of teams of translators. Yeah, yeah. That, uh, that they're, uh, uh, you know, uh, translation in a way is a lonely work. It's got to be started with one person making the translation. Uh, and then you sort of share that with other people and say, well, the others look at it and say, well, I think, I think this word is, is not, there's a better way of expressing that. So they get together and argue about it. And often it's the second opinion that wins out. Not, all, not always, but uh, sometimes. And then you get a third opinion and a fourth and a fifth. And uh, so there's a lot of long work that goes into that. Remember, the King James Version took them seven years to do that. Sorry? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, if, uh, if we... Tra the translation? Yeah, and uh, as I said, even like J.B. Phillips, he himself uh, uh, got some other people to read over his translation and criticize it and improve it. Um. <clears throat> I, I agree with you in one sense that the tra if, if it's godly people that are making the translation, then God is directing the translation. And one of the things to realize is there are some differences in, tra in the translations, like this thing about the sons and children. Uh, in, in one way, it's not a, it's not a critical difference uh, because we uh, often talk about, especially the Hebrews, when they talked about the, uh, the sons of Israel, for example, uh, they meant all the descendants, male and female, both. It was the same with, uh, with our, na used to be with our national anthem. Remember how that line go, that uh, in all thy sons, all thy sons command? Yeah. Yeah. That, that's been changed. Sons has been taken out. <laughs> but anyway, so... Um, there's that, but none of the translations, except the ones produced by heretics, like the Jehovah's Witnesses, 
have any effect on the um, on the uh, well, not well, it has they have on the actual reading, but on our doctrines, on our beliefs. None of our uh, none of the beliefs that we hold, the basic beliefs that we hold, uh, are are can be contradicted in any of the the uh, uh, the newer versions or even older versions, which is is really God's work in uh, preserving His Word. So that we can we can understand it. Now, finally, there's that question of uh, what is um, what's the best translation? <laughs> Paul says ESV. Any others? Yeah. Sorry. You think the King James? Yeah. Well, I, I, I think they're. I believe they're wrong. To put it bluntly. That. Uh, Sorry? Yeah. Well, there was a time when, uh, until about, uh, well, until the beginning of the last century, the King James Version was the Bible in English, essentially. There were a few odd little things other translations made, but basically it was the King James. And then in the last century is when we had this whole explosion of Bible translations into English. Some of it even was the evangelicals. Some of it was non. The uh, RSV, uh, uh, the Revised Standard Version, the American one from around 1950. A lot of those Bible scholars were not evangelicals. They were they had liberal theology. Many of them did not believe in the virgin birth or the physical resurrection of Jesus. And uh, so they translated things the way they saw it. The one, wor one word there that, that has been, uh, that, should we take another two minutes? You're okay with a little more? <laughs> yeah. Uh, the the one, one word that was a problem was uh, in uh, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, where the King James Version says, A virgin shall bear a son. And uh, interestingly, that word that's uh, at, uh, the Greek, uh, in Greek, the Hebrew word there for virgin is uh, a rare word, so it occurs only seven times in the Old Testament. Uh, four times the King James translated it as virgin. Uh, another couple of times it was maid, and I think once it was young woman. Uh, there's another word in uh, Hebrew that was translated virgin about 40 times. So the common word for virgin was not uh, this one word in uh, uh, in Isaiah, where is Alma, uh, but another word, uh, I forget what it is now. I, I looked this up, so <laughs> anyway. Uh, so apparently Alma can, can mean young woman or it can mean virgin. Um, I've thought, thought about that a lot. Maybe it's like the word maid in English. Uh, a maid can be just a young woman or it can refer to someone who is unmarried and, uh, and is a virgin. So uh, the King James uh, translators believed in the virgin birth, so they translated it virgin. Now, the 
I think the important thing to realize in this, all this is that the belief in the virgin birth does not rely on that um, indefinite translation of a single word in Isaiah. But the virgin birth really depend, uh, the doctrine of the virgin birth really depends on the New Testament, where it is very clear, if you remember your Christmas story, that uh, Mary was found with child by the Holy Ghost, and that Joseph uh, uh, did not have relations with her until after and that she was a virgin. So we base our uh, belief on the virgin birth, not so much on Isaiah, but rather on Matthew, where it is very clear. Uh, and uh, that issue of that, uh, that one verse in uh, uh, Isaiah, around 1950, 52, when that came out, uh, that produced a what Donald Carson called Bible rage, sort of like road rage. Uh, there were people who were burning the uh, the RSV because it was heretical. It uh, referred to a young woman instead of a virgin in Isaiah. Uh, and uh, and so on. Yeah, no question about that. Uh, that was that, uh, that part's correct. But she was more than just a young woman. She was a virgin as well. Yeah. Uh, and. Uh, I don't know, my own feeling on the, uh, we have a friend, had a friend who was, uh, she, she had difficulty reading, even in modern, straightforward English. She had difficulty reading a newspaper, even. And she was brought up on the King James Version and struggled and struggled and struggled with that because of the archaic language. Uh, then, uh, lay, several years ago, she came across uh, Eugene Peterson's The Message, which is very much a paraphrase. And it's very easy reading. It's, uh, uh, I know Jan really likes it. Uh, with the, its uh, style, it comes out with, uh, with turns of phrase that are, uh, are unique and uh, uh, sort of throw a different light on some things sometimes not false light, but just a different way of looking at things. And this lady, when she started reading the message, she said, I can finally understand the Bible. Uh, so that for her, that was the best Bible. Now, it's not a good study Bible because it is a paraphrase. So you can't decide on the basis uh, on the basis of it, really, what any particular word may have meant in Greek or Hebrew, the way you sometimes can. That's the point that you can't you can't translate word for word. You have to translate ideas. Yeah, but the closer you can get to the actual wording, the better. Uh, you can get a, a sort of a vague idea of something and express and sort of it. The words were the actual words were this. You get a vague idea that sort of what it means. You're roughly this roughly the same, and it comes out something totally different over here.
Ja. Now that goes back to my original point there that the, you have to know the original language you're translating from and the language you're translating into. You have to know both of them very well. And you have to know the cultures well as well. Every, every, every time you translate to a different language, you, you change it. There's a phrase in, uh, in Italian, uh, which uh, is a sort of a pun on, uh, uh, I forget the exact word, but anyway, it's, it essentially says translator, traitor. They're, they're very similar words in, in Italian. So that translating is really, in a way, is a traitor to the language that you're starting from. So I think the, the best Bible for you, I think, is the one that you find works best for you. As I said, as far as the basic uh, uh, fundamental beliefs, doctrines that we have, from the Bible, uh, they come out the same way in, from any version that you want, any re reasonable version. Uh, so there's no problem there. So if you like the King James Version, if you can understand Jacobean English, uh, as well as you understand modern English, fine, nothing wrong with that. Uh, I like the King James Version, some things, in it, like uh, for example, the uh, I was reading the uh, 23rd Psalm today. That's beautiful in the in the King James. Yeah, uh, mo most of us have learned those uh, uh, in the uh, in the King James. Yeah, uh, but if you if you're struggling with understanding it, try another version. The NIV is the most popular English version uh, that's uh, available these days. Uh, that's what we got in the pew here. Uh, I know Josh likes the New American Standard. Our pastor in uh, Calgary, he preferred the New Living Translation. Uh, years ago in the 70s, our pastor I uh, was dealing with a, he was a good evangelist, so we had some new Christians in the church. So he used the uh, Good News for Modern Man, today's English version, which is a fairly simple version. Uh, he, he liked to use that because it was simple and straightforward, and people who did not know any theology could follow it. And uh, maybe the best thing to do is to get two or three versions and compare them. So, well, I think end on that if you're, unless you got it. Yeah. Yeah. Always, we, we always have to rely on the Holy Spirit to interpret it to us. And uh, as uh, Peter said that no prophecy is essentially is interpreted by one person. So that uh, this is where heresies come in, is when one person starts reading something and gets his own ideas uh, and goes off on his own, uh, that's where heresy comes in. But it's when we collectively come together and study the, 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 the Bible and uh, uh, we can share our thoughts, and if I get the wrong idea, uh, if five of you say, no, 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 Rain, you're all wrong, well, maybe I better look at what I'm thinking. So it's a, it's a com 
uh, working together makes a lot of difference in, in understanding and uh, knowing what the Bible says. Uh, so anyway, uh, and so I said the, I think on the slide, slide there, yeah. you know, before buying the Bible, I uh, read a few verses in several sections of the Bible, see what it, uh, it's like. Another thing that people ne uh, almost never do, how many of you have read the section in the King James? All of you have read the King James Version, I trust. Anyone who hasn't read the King James Version? Not at all? No, I read parts. Part. No, no, I, I, meant, I meant parts. I meant just parts, even parts of it. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. How many of you have read that section at the very beginning that says, uh, fr uh, from, the, from the translators. Anyone read that? 15 pages? You've read the whole thing? Good for you. I haven't read it completely either, so. So you're ahead of the rest of us. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, Usually, every Bi almost every Bible has a, a preface or something about the the, uh, the way they translated the the Bible, what they thought. Interestingly, the New American Standard Bible that Josh likes so much, from uh, 1946 or around there, the middle of the century, anyway. Uh, it, uh, it got rid of the these and thous everywhere except where it was directly uh, addressing God. Uh, because uh, thee and thou had sort of become the holy you over the centuries from the King James Version. Uh, that's odd that uh, you know, it's a modern translation, but they, uh, 70 years ago, they preserved the the and the thou just for that one purpose. So people do odd things with translations. Now, of course, that really doesn't affect our beliefs in any way. It's just an odd thing that, that we may come across. Uh, Okay, shall we close then? Um.